What makes a hero? There's more to being a hero than simply being a story's protagonist, and far more to it than being on the side of good. Heroes are more than fighters, more than protectors, more than saviors. They are characters who rise above and beyond not only the odds, but above and beyond themselves, their fears, their prejudices, their expectations, and the expectations the world has set upon them. Whether large or small, they are on the side of right. Magic the Gathering has no shortage of heroes in its nearly 30-year history, but out of all of them, big and small, who is the greatest hero and what makes them rise so far above the many, many other worthy candidates. Presented here are our picks for not only the very best the multiverse has to offer, but also who we feel is Magic the Gathering's greatest hero. Our first honorable mention is, in many ways, the first real hero of Magic the Gathering's story, Gerard Capuchin. The reason why Gerard is just an honorable mention is that he was so clearly the hero of Magic's story, so definitively designed to be that, both in a narrative sense and within that narrative, that he's an obvious pick, must be on the list somewhere, and I really just want to get him out of the way. Now, I do not in any way mean this to diminish Gerard and his importance in the story. It was Gerard's actions and heroism that ultimately led to the end of Phyrexia and the destruction of Yawgmoth. Gerard Capuchin was the culmination of years of selective breeding conducted by Urza in order to create the perfect soldier, the ultimate hero. And in this regard, Urza succeeded. But as a character, he was largely defined by his reluctance to fulfill the destiny that he was literally bred to do. And that essentially was his arc. Gerard was bred to defeat Phyrexia. Gerard was reluctant to fulfill his destiny. Gerard ultimately had to accept his destiny. And then Gerard succeeded in doing exactly what it was he was bred to do. Keep in mind, Gerard was the hero of the storyline literally decades ago. And so, whereas heroes these days have more character and nuance, it is understandable that a character developed so long ago is so flatly defined simply by being the destined hero. And it really is a shame because the rest of the Weatherlight crew had a lot of personality that Gerard largely lacked. Whereas Gerard was defined by his reluctance to be that which he was born to be, the crew that served under him distinguished themselves with their strong characters and personality. Whether it was Sisse's swashbuckling charm, the stoic dignity of Tangarth, Squee, an absolute fan favorite, and his lovable quirkiness, the tragedy of Krovax's devotion, or even Artai's deceitful arrogance. The crew of the Weatherlight was diverse, interesting, complex, and led by Gerard, our good guy who did good things, because they are good. As we go through the list, what I want to look at as qualities within a true hero are those that rose above themselves. Those that truly sacrificed, truly defied, whether it is social expectation or even personal. And that, ultimately, is why the Jace Bellerin of the pre-mending era only gets a place among the honorable mentions. Speaking of defiance, our second honorable mention contrasts with Gerard greatly, and that is Commodore Guff, a very interesting character, one of my personal favorites from the old stories. Commodore Guff was one of the greatest scholars in the history of the multiverse, residing in a library that contained every book written, be it past, present, or even future. A powerful planeswalker in his own right, it was this knowledge of all that had been and all that was to come that defined Guff as a character. One of the original nine titans assembled by Urza to destroy Phyrexia, Guff had already read how the story ends and he knew that it ended with Phyrexia winning. While often portrayed as a comedic or humorous character, what I always loved about Commodore Guff was that, despite the fact that he felt the fate of the war had been determined, that he had read the words written on the page that said Phyrexia won, he defied it and decided to fight 
anyway, and not for a losing cause, but to try and make the future his own. Refusing to accept that Yawgmoth would inevitably win, Guff went into battle against Phyrexia, and was one of the few titans to successfully activate their soul bomb, irreparably damaging the hellish plane. Though tragically, Guff would meet his own end at the hands of Yawgmoth shortly after, the fact that he did not accept what had been written as fate, and defied against his very beliefs for what is right, is what unquestionably makes him one of the greatest heroes in Magic's history all while being an utter bookworm with a sense of humor. Beginning our top 10 proper list of the greatest heroes is one of the greats of Mirrodin's history, Slobad the Goblin. Born on an inauspicious day in goblin society and condemned to death, Slobad escaped this cruel fate by being hidden away. Eventually, he was rescued by the Krark clan, though he never did feel at home among them and left to wander the plain of Mirrodin. In his wanderings, he encountered his first true friend, the elf Glissa Sunseeker. After learning of some strange occurrences, the two would set out on a journey that would reveal the true nature of Mirrodin and its corrupted guardian Memnark. Along with the golem Bosch, Glissa and Slobad attempted to stop Memnark's evil plans by assembling Cauldra. They were foiled in this effort, and Bosch lost his life. Shortly thereafter, Slobad was captured by Memnark. The twisted golem tortured the poor goblin and used him as a tool for five years. Glissa, however, would return to her friend, fighting Memnark and knocking him into Mirrodin's core along with herself. By some chance, the planeswalker spark that lay dormant within Glissa transferred to Slobad. Godlike powers rushed into the tiny goblin. But instead of wielding the near-omnipotent power of a planeswalker spark for his own ends, he willingly sacrificed it in order to restore the lives of all those whom Memnark had killed. Though he would ultimately meet a tragic and pointless end, this one enormous act of altruism sets Slobat apart, not just from other heroes, but from the megalomaniacal planeswalkers of that story's era, most of whom, even the supposed good ones, allowed ultimate power to ultimately corrupt them. But Slobad gave it all up just to save the lives of innocents he did not even know, making him not only perhaps the greatest goblin to have ever lived, but perhaps as well one of the greatest planeswalkers to ever have ignited. At number nine, we move now from the greatest of goblins to the humblest of humans, as our next hero is the Wojek officer and frequent savior of Ravnica, Agris Koss. From childhood, Agris Koss knew he wanted to devote his life to protecting the citizens of Ravnica, and to this end he joined the Boros Legion as soon as he came of age. Young and idealistic at first, Agris came to learn the harsh and complex realities of life in the City of Guilds. While working a case, Agris learned that his partner, someone he admired greatly, was corrupt, and Agris was ultimately forced to fight him, leading to his partner's death. Agris may have turned to the bottle thereafter, but he never stopped trying to protect the Ravnican people. In his later years, he was set to receive a promotion to a desk job, but on his last mission, he uncovered a plot by the secretive House Demir, ultimately arresting their guild leader, the vampire Sazdek, stopping him from assassinating Mat Selesnia. In retirement, Agris went to work for the Orzov Syndicate, where he helped to uncover another plane-threatening plot to awaken long-dormant dragons. Agris and his companions foiled the plot, though in the process, Agris was killed. Death, however, was not the end of Agris Koss's heroism. As a ghost, Agris went on to foil Zazdek once again, slew the Simic guildmaster Momir Vig, and ended the corrupt reign of Grand Arbiter Augustin IV. From humble birthright, despite the most humblest of births and lineage, nothing could stop Agris Koss for fighting for what was right for Ravnica, not even death itself. Moving from Mirrodin to Ravnica, we come to the plain of Dominaria, which indeed has played host to some of the most powerful beings in the multiverse, but few have been as benevolent as Freyles. Freyles was born a dark elf on the plain of Dominaria during the era of the Late Dark Age, and was orphaned soon after. Originally a fire mage centered on red mana, after being mortally wounded by the green mage Jason Carthalian, her spark ignited, 
and she ascended into godhood as a planeswalker. Remembering the power of the attack that nearly killed her, she was drawn towards green magic ever after. As was often the case with planeswalkers, her ascent destabilized her sanity, but she managed to recover much of it with the help of Archmage Eternal Joda. During the Dominarian Ice Age, Freilis worked tirelessly to aid the elves of Findhorn and Lanawar, who began to view her as a god. It was Freilis herself who put an end to the Ice Age, casting the world spell with the help of Joda's magical mirror. Her next great exploit was as a member of Urza's Nine Titans, being one of only two titans who managed to both activate their soul bomb and survive Yogmoth's attack. Her final great act was to seal the rift over Sky Shroud, choosing to sacrifice her then immortal and near omnipotent life to heal the wounded plane of her birth one last time. Many other green aligned planeswalkers have followed Freilis, but not have ever surpassed her in might or valor, and very likely none of them ever will. Now, at number seven, we come to Elspeth Tyrell, born on an unknown plane exposed to the taint of Phyrexia. Elspeth's childhood was one of horror. Like many citizens of her home, Elspeth was imprisoned and tortured by the Phyrexians. At the age of 13, her spark ignited, casting her across the multiverse and freeing her from her captors. The first plane she landed upon was Theros, where she acquired the Sword of Chaos and first met Daxos of Miletus. When the sun god Heliod revealed himself, however, she was overwhelmed and fled Theros. After more harrowing journeys, Elspeth ended up on the paradisiacal plain of Bant. On Bant, she learned how to fight and became a knight of great renown. But during the conflux, Elspeth fled after seeing the purity of her adopted home tainted by the other shards. Not long after that, she was recruited by the planeswalker Koth to help him free his home of Phyrexia. Despite the trauma and terrors of her childhood, Elspeth faced the Phyrexians again, liberating Karn alongside Koth, who ultimately forced her to flee the plane when it became apparent that the war was, for the time being anyway, lost. It was once again on Theros that Elspeth's greatest deeds would be done. She slew the great Hydra, Palukranos, became the champion of Heliod, reunited with Daxos, and helped end the Minotaur attack on Akros. Tragedy, however, goes hand in hand with heroism, especially on the plain of Theros. After the battle, Elspeth and Daxos finally admitted their feelings for one another, only for Xenagos to trick Elspeth into murdering her love. This led Elspeth on a quest that would ultimately see her destroy the newly deified Xenagos, only to die herself by her own sword in the very hands of her patron, Heliod. Death, however, is not the end on Theros. From the underworld, Elspeth began to rebuild herself, destroying the reputation of Heliod and returning to the world of the living. What she will do next is unknown, but what is certain is that she will do it with courage, with honor, and with an unwavering sense of what is right. Hitman, con artist, bandit, thief. These are not the traits that a hero is typically made of. Unless, of course, we are talking about the legendary Ronin, Toshira Umezawa, number six on our list. In his youth, Toshi, as he was known to his friends, worked for the crime lord Uramon. But on a faithful job, he met the fearsome ogre, Haidsugu. Together they founded the Hyozin Reckoners. It was some years later that this criminal's heroic career would begin. While traveling through Jukai, Toshi encountered, and later rescued, Princess Michiko Konda. Toshi and Michiko met the Kami of the Crescent Moon, who introduced Toshi to the Kami that would prove his greatest patron, the Myojin of Night's Reach. Combined with the Myojin's patronage and his own kanji magic, Toshi managed to save Michiko once again. Not long after, Toshi managed to steal the Shadow Gate from his old boss Uramon, and the Myojin of Night's Reach rewarded him for doing so by fusing it to him. Toshi could now travel wherever there were shadows, almost instantaneously. This ability came in handy when he snuck into the Palace of Konda and stole the Stone Trophy. 
though the Myojin of Knight's Reach forbade him from carrying it through her realm. The trophy was, in reality, that which was taken, and contained the child of the great Kami O Kagachi. Konda's theft of the trophy had been the instigating act of the ongoing Kami War. Now empowered, Toshi would go on to interfere in a number of matters, occasionally causing harm and reckoning with his past. Toshi lost his powers after disobeying the Myojin of Knight's Reach's dictate, carrying Konda's trophy through her realm. But luckily, he found himself once again in the presence of Princess Michiko. Writing the words sisters and united in blood upon the trophy, Toshi gave it to Michiko. The trophy shattered, and the spirit within, Kaiodai, fused with Michiko to form the sisters of flesh and spirit. Together, they defeated O Kagachi and brought peace to Kamigawa once more. Satisfied that he had played his part, Toshi departed the scene, only to be attacked by an old foe seeking revenge. As he lay dying, the Myojin of Night's Reach returned and transported him to a different plane, Dominaria. It was here that he founded Clan Umazawa, a prestigious and heroic dynasty famed for producing Tetsuya Umazawa, the first slayer of Nicol Bolas. Umazawa's legacy on his home plane of Kamigawa is as yet unknown. His lineage still thrives on Dominaria, and the fact that there is a Kamigawa at all to return to in Neon Dynasty is largely due to his efforts. Kickstarting our top five is the Archmage Eternal himself, Joda. A descendant of Kayla bin Krug, the wife of Urza and lover of Mishra, Joda was born into a wealthy and powerful family on the Dominarian continent of Terrassier. The severe climate change Dominaria experienced in the centuries after the Brothers' War meant that the land on which the family lived grew less viable year after year, and by the time Joda reached adulthood, it had been abandoned. Apprenticed to the wandering mage Vaska, Joda traveled the land, escaping the magic-hating clutches of the Church of Tal. While attempting to hide from some goblins, Joda submerged himself in an enchanted fountain, which effectively granted him immortality. His journeys brought him to the Conclave of Mages, where he became an unwitting pawn in their political intrigues, ultimately freeing their former leader, Ith, and making an intractable enemy of the pretender, Mare Sill. Throughout the Dominarian Ice Age, Joda continued to fight against the forces of darkness, particularly the necromancer Limdul, and played a key part in ending the era of ice itself by loaning his magical mirror to Freilis. His final confrontation with his nemesis, Mare Sill, came when he helped save his friend, Jaya Ballard, from the influence of the pretender's ring once again using his mirror, which caused Jaya's planeswalker spark to ignite. Though he would no longer be the focus of Dominarian legends, the Archmage Eternal, as Joda is now known, would go on to play a critical supporting role in his ancestor Urza's quest to defeat Phyrexia. The Rift Crises, and even the recent conflict between the new Weatherlight and the demon lord Belzenlock. So long as Joda lives, and that may be forever at this point, Dominaria has a hero protecting it. Our fourth greatest hero is the only member of the Gatewatch whose actions truly qualify them as a hero. Someone who rose above all odds, even themselves, to do what was right, no matter the sacrifice. And that, of course, is the planeswalker Liliana Vess the Gatewatch's greatest hero. Originally introduced as a femme fatale, Liliana has long suffered under the lazy stereotypes of such a characterization. Her own name being an anagram for villainess, she was conceived of as vain, cruel, selfish, manipulative, and sexy. 
Ah, that's right, because there's nothing more villainous than a sexy woman. These are the sort of sexist and outdated traits one might associate with a character in a 1950s film noir, not a modern-day fantasy property. And perhaps because of this, Liliana's character has had some of the most fundamental, significant, and meaningful growth and development, taking her from the realm of caricature to vibrant and deep character. Truly, within both the fiction and the non-fiction world that created her, Liliana Vest defied all expectations. Born on Dominaria before the Mending Era, Liliana began life as the prodigal daughter of a powerful warlord. As a young woman of a wealthy and noble family, Liliana originally was a healer, but as her beloved brother fell ill, she was willing to do anything, at any cost, to save his life, even attempting to use the forbidden necromancy arts to create a remedy that would save her brother's life. Unbeknownst to her, she had been tricked by visions of the Raven Man, costing her her brother's soul which twisted dark and cruel as he was revived into an undead monster who blamed her for her negligence and stupidity and set her family home to cinders. Almost dying at her own now undead brother's hands, Liliana's planeswalker spark ignited, hurtling her across the multiverse, first to the plane of Innistrad, where she, now an immortal demigod, could pursue knowledge and power at any cost. In fact, this life of age Ageless and supreme power suited her well, but that would change, of course, with the mending. Stripped of her godlike powers and immortality, age and all of its indignities began to catch up with the mighty necromancer. Desperate to regain her youth and power, Liliana sold her soul to four powerful demons in a contract brokered by the elder dragon Nicol Bolas. Age and death no longer being a threat for her, Liliana nonetheless found it difficult to obtain peace. Her will, her very soul, was no longer her own, and visions of the mysterious Raven Man haunted her, echoes of her brother's death confronting her, her guilt, her selfishness, outlasting all. In a struggle to once again be in control of her own body, her own soul, her own destiny, she began to resent the power her masters held upon her. When quested with retrieving the ancient chain veil artifact, Liliana once again was willing to sacrifice herself for power and allowed it to corrupt her soul so that she might gain the ability to destroy her demon masters. Over the next few years, Liliana sought out and destroyed her demonic overlords. Liliana took up the chain veil accepted its curse in exchange for the powers it granted her, and slew the first of her four demon masters. But still, she found no respite. The curse now consuming her, Liliana made whatever allegiances she could, from the planeswalker Jace Bellerin to the Gatewatch itself, to do whatever she could, to use whoever she could for her own survival. Eventually, with the help of her nominal allies in the Gatewatch, Liliana triumphed over her last demonic overlord. However, her contract defaulted to the being who brokered it, Nicol Bolas. Bolas, who had been building an enormous army of zombies for decades, forced Liliana to take command during the War of the Spark. It was here that Liliana felt regret. Regret at betraying her friends in the Gatewatch, regret at her use and abuse of Jace Bellerin, and regret for the paths she had chosen, that Liliana stood forward in defiance and said, no more. Having sacrificed everything to simply continue living, Liliana was willing to sacrifice her life to save not only her friends, but the countless lives of Ravnica and the rest of the multiverse that would fall inevitably under Bolas's rule. That death in the act of doing what was right for helping others who had helped her, for helping others who would never know her, is what makes Liliana one of the greatest heroes in Magic the Gathering. Her friend and ally, Gideon Jura, sacrificed himself to save her. And truly, Liliana would have died then, alive and finally free. Liliana defeated Nicol Bolas, robbing him of his planeswalker spark and sparing near-infinite planes from the Elder Dragon's tyranny. And after defeating, truly, one of the multiverse's greatest evils, 
This villainess, who was originally conceived of and defined by her sexual being, took up the least sexy profession of them all, college professor. And now we reach the top three. Unlike my list of the greatest villains in the history of Magic the Gathering, there is no clear-cut order for our top three heroes. I cannot name a greatest one among the three. Perhaps you will feel one stands higher than the others, and that is fair, for truly these three are the greatest of the great. But as far as this video is concerned, they are, each of them, the number three, the number two, and the number one greatest heroes in magic. Standing alongside one another forever, I hope, are the Talarian Trifecta, but you might know them as Teferi, Joyra, and Karn. While Jason the Gatewatch may be splashed over every Magic the Gathering advertisement, I feel that its real stars, the true protagonists of Magic's story overall, since the beginning and even today, are these three characters. The origins of these heroes all lie on the plane of Dominaria, and while that is where many of their heroic actions have occurred, the ramifications of those actions span the multiverse. Born in Zalfir, Shiv, and the Mind of Urza, respectively, the lives of these heroes have long been intertwined. Joyra and Teferi showed great promise as children, and were brought to the Talarian Academy when they were still quite young. Karn, in contrast, was made by Urza, crafted from silver and the hearthstone of his deceased ally Zancha. The three would soon be bound together by friendship, as well as Urza's destructive time experiments. Together they fought against Krik and his Phyrexians, operated the mana rig on Shiv to produce the necessary components of the skyship Weatherlight, and helped fortify Dominaria's defenses for Yogmoth's inevitable invasion. Though Karn alone among them would participate in that greatest of battles. All three were instrumental in Urza's plans. These three were not just heroes as deigned by Urza, born to fulfill his prophecies and ceasing thereafter. After the destruction of Urza and Phyrexia and the death of Yogmoth, these three heroes united in order to end the Rift Crisis, saving not only Dominaria again, but the whole of the multiverse and ushering in the Great Mending. Teferi, having lost his spark and his homeland during the crisis, would go on to live the quiet life of a husband and father. Karn retreated to Mirrodin, an artificial plane of his own creation, where he bore witness to the rise of a new Phyrexia. Joyra, never content to stand still for long, eventually began work on a new skyship weatherlight. It was aboard this new weatherlight that these three friends and heroes united once more. And what truly sets them apart is neither the vast span of time in which they have been heroic, nor the scale of their heroism, but the fact that they have suffered defeats, sacrificed greatly, made enormous errors in judgment, only to learn and grow from these experiences and continue on. They never gave up. They never gave in. In many ways, they stand as the perfect foil for their old mentor, Urza, who did give up, who did give in. When Urza was obsessed with vengeance and destroying Phyrexia, these three were devoted to protecting the lives of those whom Yagmoth and his monstrosities sought to assimilate, and who Urza viewed simply as pawns in his grand scheme. These three were motivated by a desire to protect the individual lives within those planes, within all planes. Where Urza saw his mistakes as mere setbacks in his grand scheme, these three are, even today, haunted by their failures and striving to make right on the wrongs they have done, all while simultaneously swearing to do better in the future. That is what makes a hero. That is why Urza is not a hero, not on this list. As elders of sorts among the heroes of modern Magic the Gathering, Teferi, Joyra, and Karn set a great example for all of their fellows. Do your best, and when that isn't enough, learn to do better.